You're looking at a building that you would find in any part of the world. And for reasons I don't understand, we as a society have decided to build buildings out of stacks of cubes. Now, the problem is that cubes have no structural integrity. And by that I mean that no matter how well I bolt this building to the ground, no matter how strong its columns and its beams are, this building is held up exclusively by its corners. It's only as strong as its weakest corners. Now, what an earthquake does principally is move the ground from side to side. And you can see how weak this building is. Many earthquakes also move the ground up and down. And again, this building is very weak. And all earthquakes produce torsion, twisting motion. And you can see this building is extremely weak. If any one of these corners breaks, this building is coming down. Now, this is the exact same building, except all I've done is snapped in, just snapped in, these little triangular corner braces. Now, look. 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 This building is strong. This building is going to survive any earthquake. This building costs only 15% more to build than this one. The cost of a bathroom in a building. But nobody is going to go from this building to this building unless they're convinced they're at risk. And that's where we failed society. We have not explained to people, in terms they understand, where the seismic risk is high, so people can see that there's a decision to make to preserve themselves and their families. And so five years ago, we started or founded the Global Earthquake Model, or GEM, to build the world's first ever seismic risk model and make it available to the public at large. Because much of this risk information is today only available in a small number of developed countries and often only for paying customers of that information. And this is something we owe the public. Now, let me show you something else. What's very common in most parts of the world is to recover the investment of building the building. The builder will use that bottom floor for retail space. Think big picture windows. No reinforcement. And now we have what engineers called a soft first story building. This building is weak at the knees. This is the worst possible building you can build. And this building is almost certain to come down because it's heavier on top than on the bottom. And what will happen is that this building will break on the bottom floor and all the top floors will fall at 32 feet per second per second and implode successively as they hit ground. And that is the fate of so many buildings all over the world in large earthquakes. Now, these buildings are wooden, but for most buildings that we are in today, they're what we call reinforced concrete. So rather than external triangles, it's rebar, rods of rib steel that go through the concrete pillars and beams, flare out at the corners, and are wrapped with more rebar to make them strong. After the 1999 Izmit earthquake in Turkey, a magnitude 7.6 event, I was with a group interviewing survivors. And we met a young professional couple, the Erkmans. And they explained to us that when they were married, they were given a very a, uh, iron uh, frame bed. And when the earthquake struck, their five-year-old son was in another room, they were on the second story of one of these soft first-story buildings. And all of the stories above them slammed down on the top of their bed, but were held by that iron bed. They couldn't move. They were completely pinned in in about this amount of room. Mr. Erkman was eventually able to break open the floorboard, and he found a PVC tube, and he broke it off, and water came out. And they were able to stay, uh, to have water 
for the 60 hours it took until they were rescued. Their son died. And afterwards, we went to the side of their building, and the nearly identical next door building was partially standing. And I could see a giant crack in one of these corners. And I wanted to be able to get my, I could get my arm in that crack to feel the rebar and to feel how much there was. So I was put on a hydraulic lift, and I stuck my arm in, and I pulled out a hunk of styrofoam. The world would be a safer place if concrete were translucent. <laughs> so what's happened in the 13 or 14 years since that 1999 earthquake and today? We've seen almost a million earthquake deaths, a greatly accelerating toll. How could that be? Two reasons. One, population is flowing into the world's megacities, cities with more than a million people. And in so doing, people are building at higher density and poor quality buildings. And there are about 50 of these megacities astride the Earth's plate tectonic boundaries. And these cities are caught between the demographic and seismic forces. They are the targets of chance. Let me show you what I mean in terms of construction quality. This is a typical slum high-density development. Notice the great corners. So we know what happens to buildings like this. These are buildings in Turkey where, incidentally, every building is basically a soft first story because of setback rules. You can only build out to a certain distance from the edge of your property, but it only applies to the first floor. So people build wider buildings from the second store up. They're all top-heavy. Now let's look at population, just the population density that we have today. So here is the population of Europe and North Africa. And until I saw this globe, I hadn't appreciated that Egypt is not a country, it's a river. It's just a river of humanity in inky blackness. There's nothing else. No one's home in Switzerland, it turns out. Now, if we were to put up the cities that are at risk, the megacities, we begin to see places like Tehran and Istanbul and uh, Algiers. And then there are plenty of other cities at lower risk. Now, if I, what I want to do is swipe that away again, and I simply want to flip the globe over and show you population density on the other side of the globe. And here it is. Look at Java at the bottom of the image, the most densely populated place on Earth. Look at the Ganges Plain in northern India, 400 million people. Look at China. If we now put cities at risk on this map, you begin to appreciate the full magnitude of the problem, the rapidly growing numbers of people living in harm's way is a colossal problem. And it's very likely that one of the red dots on this map will be the site of the million death earthquake in our lifetime. Now let's take a closer look at India. India has been in a 40 million year long slow motion collision into Asia. It's as if in a car crash, the front, the engine has already been shoved into the driver's seat, but the people in the back seat don't even know that a collision is in progress. And the front bumper of that collision are those red ellipses, sites of magnitude eight to nine earthquakes that have struck over the last millennia. One earthquake alone in 1897 over there on the right reduced to rubble every masonry building over an area the size of England. And today, the population 115 years later there is 10 times higher. So all of these people in the Ganges Plain are at risk from an earthquake, but since we have not had great earthquakes there in several generations, there's no cultural memory of this. And so no efforts are being made to prepare for that. Now the consequences of this collision do not, are not limited 
to that front fender. They extend deeply into Asia. These blue vectors, so we were, the India indenter is what I was describing as the car being mashed into Asia. And you can see Asia flowing out away from that impact zone and flowing into Southeast Asia and China. So those blue arrows are the movements of land every year, about an inch a year on the, you can see the scale on the lower left. And any place where you see two arrows changing length or direction, the Earth is being strained. And that strain has to be released eventually by earthquakes, such as in the middle of the image, the site of the 2008 Wenchan earthquake in China, which killed 80,000 people, 20,000 of them were children in schools that were built like my unreinforced stack of cubes. So what we need to do to create a global model of earthquake hazards is to capture the straining that is released by earthquakes, to capture our last hundred years of instrumentally recorded earthquakes, those historical earthquakes that take us farther back, and to find the faults on which they occur. So this these vectors are used, collected from around the world, 15,000 of them, that go into building this strain model of earthquakes. You can see the rectangle is where we were before. And you can also see now that we have these bright red bands of extremely high strain and yellow bands where also the strains are high. And most of these red bands, such as at Sumatra and Java and Taiwan and Japan, or what we call subduction zones. These are the places where the Earth's crust gets shoved underneath island arcs or continents and produces the greatest earthquakes that we know. So we've created a model of the world's subduction zones. There are 40,000 of them. And you can see that this was the site of uh, last year's Tohoku earthquake in Japan, of the magnitude 9.2, 8.7, and 8.5 earthquakes in Sumatra the 8.3 and 8.2 earthquakes in Tonga. So subduction zones are illuminated themselves by earthquakes. So here are the last 100 years of earthquakes, which we have relocated as part of the Global Earthquake Model Project. So you can see Sumatra and Java, the Philippines, bathed in earthquakes. You can also see the earthquakes extending northward from India and into Asia, associated with that blue arrow as I showed you before. So relocating the world's earthquake was a huge task, but an important one, because from about 1900 to 1950, those original earthquakes were not located with computers. So doing this all over again with uniform tools gives us a much better sense of where these earthquakes took place. Let me give you an example in Taiwan. So an earthquake that was located well offshore the island of Taiwan that struck in 1909 when relocated using these computer techniques turns out to lie beneath Taipei, Taiwan's capital city of six million people, topped by the 101 story uh, Taipei 101 building, which the uh, Taipei people call a stack of Chinese takeout cartons. <laughs> Not only do we now see that the seismic risk is higher than we thought before these earthquakes were relocated, this city also, on the edge of this city, lies what we believe to be an active fault, a fault capable of producing a large earthquake. And truly, the most important target for any effort to make people aware of the earthquake hazards is to hunt down all of the active faults in urban areas. And I'm thinking of places like Bogota, six million people living next to an active fault. Until this work was done by the global earthquake model, the Bogota fault was not recognized to be active, and now it is. Think of the 15 million people living next to an active fault in Tehran. This is a country with a very long, rich history, and that history is replete with huge, damaging earthquakes. And we know what happens when urban areas are juxtaposed to 
faults that move in large earthquakes, such as the Kashmir 2005 event. This is Balakot Hill. Every single building on that hill was destroyed in the earthquake. 1,600 people lost their lives right there. If we move to South America, we see a problem very similar to Asia. Again, the white is population in the area, and you can see the population is engulfed in earthquakes in all of northern South America. Now, Ecuador faces this risk considerably because its capital city, Quito, lives in the middle of this. And Ecuador, as a nation, joined the global earthquake model two years ago. Here is Quito. A million people, a mile high, living on top of what's believed to be an active fault. But what they did was, with the help of the global earthquake model, the Ecuadorian scientists and engineers built their first ever seismic hazard model. And you can see it here, and you can see that Quito lies in the highest hazard zone. And inspired by this, the government has built its first ever building code, so that the right kind of buildings can be built in Quito rather than continuing this. And in addition, for the first time, earthquake insurance can be offered because there is a model to price the risk, which is an essential element without which you can't have insurance. And so it's important to recognize that if you design for it, even modest homes can be built to survive earthquakes. This beautiful home-built building I came upon in the Andes, look at it. It's light on top, not heavy on top. It's filled with strong, flexible materials, and it's filled with triangles. Earthquake-resistant buildings can actually be gorgeous. Here is one, also in the Andes, also triangles everywhere you look. One of the things that uh, the global earthquake model is trying to do is to make sure that we teach our children the lessons of earthquake science and safety so that they can be the vanguard of our efforts to live in a safer world. So working together with Teachers Without Borders, the Earthquake Engineering Research Institution, and the US Geological Survey, where I work, we are uh, creating a curriculum where teachers in the countries that you see there will learn how to teach seismic science and safety to 100,000 girls. Each of the schools will get a seismometer, both for teaching and to join them up into a network where we can record and the girls can record earthquakes. And uh, 5,000 um, uh, 5, teachers will be trained, and together these girls will help start the discussion between civic authorities and the population. And they will be also surveying all the buildings first in their schools and then in the broader community to determine which buildings ha are seismically weak. We need to collect this information. 100,000 girls will create a survey of a million buildings. All of that will be in the public trust as a part of the Global Earthquake Models database. This image is one that I've always found arresting. You're looking at a man, aged 22 years old, about 22, and his arms are around a woman aged about 19. She has her arms around a baby. You can see the skull, less than a year old. This family was crushed by their dwelling in 365 AD in the Roman port town of Curion on Cyprus. Surely, 16 centuries after this family lost their lives, the Erkmans should not have suffered a similar fate as so many others are, we must learn to build better in places where the risk is high. Thank you.